Hi everybody, I'm Rob Bryden wearing a bright shirt. Thanks for coming back. If you haven't already subscribed, why not do it, you lazy devil? Today's guest seems like a fine fellow. We've met several times. I will say this to his face, that he is to me, he's someone who gives the appearance of having been designed and created by Jim Henson. It is Josh Whittacom. <laughs> And Hello. there he is. How there are you? Is. Well, I'm all right. How are you? Look at you. Very good. Very good. Good to speak to you. So how are you? I'm very good, thanks. I'm really good. You're, you're under a heading of people that I like, but I've never spent too much time with. So so I, I really look forward then to having this time to chat. I, I mean, I've seen the, the names you've had, Rob, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal uh, guest list. Wow. So it's a... It's an honour. Now, first of all, so much to talk about with you. And in my introduction to you, and I, this occurred to me when you were on Would I Lie to You, and I think the last series, which I don't think has gone out yet, but I remember looking across to you, sitting in the Bob Mortimer seat, as it's come to be known. Mm. And I was gazing at you because you're an, you're an appealing fellow. And as I looked at you, I thought, I wonder how he'd feel if I said that when I look at you, I could believe that you had been designed and created by Jim Henson. <laughs> I take that as a compliment. I think I, mean, I, I can see. I can see <laughs> there's a certain element to the voice, isn't there? I think the, the voice. The voice helps it, but I think yeah. it's the physicality. You, as I said, I described you, and this is all true, all sincere. You're very appealing. There's something very appealing about you. And as you sat there next next to Lee, who I mean. Good God, he's a lot of things. He's not appealing. <laughs> uh, he's appealing for help. And to see you sat next to him, I just thought Jim Henson. Now, I'm quite pleased if no one has said that to you before. That's never happened. Omid said to me that it, I, I reminded him of Frankie Howard, which I'd never anticipated. Let me give you a, a nice bit of trivia to, uh, to accompany that puppet analogy, which is that uh, my wife's mum is the woman that invented Zippy. <laughs> well, listen, you're not a million miles away. No. You're closer to Zippy than I am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that's fair. <laughs> Isn't that true? Well, yeah. that's fascinating. Now, you either have or will at some point enter therapy to discuss this with your wife. <laughs> Was your wife subliminally looking for this comforting thing that her mother had created I'd be lying if I said that hasn't crossed my mind at points in the sense of there, there's an obvious uh, comparison to be made. And then the thought of your mum creating a fictional character that you then kind of, uh, well, not end up marrying, but it, it's like some, you know, if there was a, a Hollywood movie and it turned out that Zippy had been made into a human and then it was me, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be outlandish, would it? Have you worked with a lot of puppets? We've I've worked with quite a few of the big puppets in the uh, on the last leg. Cause we which, which one? Which ones have you worked with? So we've had we've had Basil Brush on numerous occasions. Yeah, okay, but hold on because Basil Brush now is not Basil Brush because Basil now is isn't he Ivan's son that does it now? We've had Kermit and Miss Piggy on the last leg. That was quite thrilling. But again, who was doing them? Yeah, well, it wasn't Jim Henson. And I mean, Frank I mean, Oz, yeah. no, it wasn't them, No, was no, it? exactly. What I should say then is I've worked with a lot of tribute acts to Great <laughs> Puppets. <laughs> Listen, I stood next to R2-D2 once when I was on Graham Norton. And we were backstage and, I mean, clearly they've made a million R2-D2s. Um, Kenny Baker wasn't mm. in there. But I did have a, a bit of a thrill at standing next to an official R2-D2. Yes, I, I think... Stuff like that, I, c I can see. I mean, I'm not a Star Wars... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have any time for Star Wars in, in my life. Now, you saying that you're not a Star Wars person, I am wondering if that's because you fell... Your, your, your age means... And how old are you now, Josh? 38. 38. So that means that you fell between the films, perhaps, so, so it, it didn't work Ooh. for you. Because it's all very generation-specific, which brings me beautifully to your book. Because your book... As I understand it, Josh, and I think I do, equates your childhood growing up in the West Country, yes. an, an upbringing which, by your own admission, was unconventional, 
Yes. And you tie it in with all the television of your youth. Now, I'm interested to see where your childhood television is going to overlap with me, a youthful 56. <laughs> well, I think I, I think I watched a lot of grown-up television growing up. So my parents would let me watch anything, really. So I imagine in terms of the comedy I watched, it overlaps greatly with, with the stuff that you would have been watching. So, you know, I was at... I was watching Bottom at the age of 10 or whatever. Yeah, I imagine yeah. you were watching that at the age of 30 or whatever. Well, I, I joined them on The Young Ones. You see, so you're too young for The Young Ones, yeah? Yeah, I've seen it, obviously. Yeah, know. but no, you see, if you know... And another thing you, you, you talk about with the book is, is how you're of that generation where people did all watch the same show at the same time. Yes. It, not like it is now. I remember when The Young Ones started, and anybody of my generation will tell you this, particularly if they're in comedy, I can remember going into school the next day and saying, my God, did you see that thing last night? Yeah. It was. It had that much of an impact. The thing with, like, the 90s was the last decade where the television was, it was the most important piece of furniture in the house. Do you know what I mean? It was, <laughs> it was the only piece of furniture that mattered, really. And you'd go into school the next day and you'd discuss whether it be Gladiators or whether it be TFI Friday or whether it be Neighbours or all these things. And now, with the way things have gone, and obviously television is of very high quality on Netflix, etc., etc. I'm not claiming there's a golden age of television that we've overlooked that was 90s. But now you'll watch something on Netflix, you'll try and talk to someone about it. They're at a different stage. You're, you're actively not allowed to talk to them about it. Like, it's the one thing that's off limits is the discussion of television. Like, it was all we had. It was, the, it was the window we had into a much more exciting existence. Tell me particularly then the comedies, because one thing I was surprised at was hearing you say once that you loved comedy as a kid but it wasn't something you thought you would do. I didn't consider it as something that I would do. I, I didn't want to be a performer. I loved comedy. Uh, the way when I was a child that I seemed to articulate loving something was learning everything about it. <laughs> so that started with the Italian 90 World Cup when I got into football at, at seven. I'd just learn and learn and I'd be interested. You know how children, you learn. And I did that with uh, music and I did that with comedy there was no part of you then thinking yeah I'm, I'm one of those people that that's where I belong I'm, I'm one of those people because that's what I felt I, I was feeling that's where I want to be that's my thing how on earth can I get into that world I thought I was one of those people in the sense that I identified with these people in a way that I didn't identify with so kind of the, the height of that was I was kind of obsessed with Badil and Skinner. I knew that they lived in a flat together because they did in real life and on TV. And I used to kind of, th I used to think about what it would be like to live in that flat with Badil <laughs> and Skinner. Where were you living? What were your circumstances when you were having these thoughts? I was at home with my parents as a teenager. <laughs> I was 12 or 13 or whatever. And you're going, obviously, if I had lived with David and Frank Skinner, it'd be very weird indeed. It would There'd have been lots of talk in the tabloids about what was going on in that situation. That would have been very odd. So you're loving comedy. You're, you're, st you're a student of comedy. But you've no desire to necessarily be one of those people. So how did that happen? Because you very much are one of those people yeah. now. And I, um, so I finished uni in, and I didn't really know what to do. So what, were, what were you studying at uni? I did linguistics, but it was, I was oh. basically doing... Très bien. Yes, yes, that's a get you a two-two probably at that stage. Um, it's uh, it was fine, but I was basically there to do. Um, I just wanted to go to university. It was, it was I just got in before it was really expensive. I'll be honest with you, I chose Manchester because I loved the Smiths, and it was that simple. <laughs> It was literally that simple. That's how, and then I chose a course because I wanted to live in Manchester. And so I kind of just did that. And then I didn't know what to do. And then I worked at Waterstones. And then I moved to London. I worked for Dora the Explorer magazine for a year. Did you? I didn't I, know that about yeah. you, Dora. We used to watch that when the kids were younger. I ended up working as a kind of low-level sub-editor at The Guardian, but I was never very good at it wow. uh, on the sport website bit. And then... I just didn't know what to do, but I wanted to write or working, like write 
funny, kind of writing comedy or something. And I was told stand up was a good way to get in. So I just started gigging. What? Hang on a second. You you wanted to write comedy, and someone said to you, "Well, stand up's a good way," and that's why you started doing it. Yeah, that is why I started doing it. I had no. I didn't want to be a stand up in that sense. I I had no kind of inclination to. Perform, you know, you've got really. people who all they want in their life is to be a stand up. It burns inside them, awful, and they it? try. No, it's not awful. It's life, and they try and they try and they try. You. You are going, oh, well, that's a way to get to it. And I'll give that a go. Boom. By the time I was doing it, it was really oversubscribed. There's <laughs> loads of gigs. Yeah. And there was no audience. You're doing gigs where there was 12 acts and five audience members. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. I did one gig where there was two audience members who were on a date, on a first date, all this kind of stuff, right? And, and when, when are we? Give us a year for this. 2008 I started. Right. So okay. when I was like 24, yeah. 25. Yeah. Because I kind of threw myself into it so much, it kind of led to the end of a long-term relationship. And then I was like, well, I've got nothing else now. I feel kind of nostalgic for it, but it was a pretty tough thing to do. I can look at anything with rose-tinted glasses if it's more than a week ago. <laughs> Is that right? Is that a quality I'm, you have? Yeah, I'm already nostalgic for... Euro 2020. I ask everybody that comes on here um, if they remember where we first met. And, and I, I think I know where we first met, but I may be wrong. Do you want me to tell you or do you want to? Well, I'm going to give you what I think it was. OK, yeah. I think it was Manchester. No, that's the second time we met. Was that the second time? It yeah. was the most notable time, though, wasn't it? Well, I was supporting Stephen Merchant. Yeah. And... Um, and we were staying in the Lowry Hotel, which yeah. you were staying in. I think I was on tour. Yeah, and we walked past. So Stephen, I remember him telling me on tour he has a rule, which That's is right. he's happy to stop to talk to anyone. Yeah. But if anyone shouts at him in the street, he will ignore them. Yeah. And we walked past someone who shouted at us on, on the bridge on by the hotel. On that bridge behind the yeah. Lowry, yeah. And he was like, there's another one of them. <laughs> And then his phone starts ringing and it's you. And it turns out we've ignored you. Yes. And um, it's lucky he picked it up because if he then hadn't picked it, if he'd done that, it's always a gamble oh, to phone God, someone that you can see. Imagine if he'd seen that and I, that would have broken my heart. <laughs> yeah. So that was, but that was the second time I met what you. What was the, the first, first time, time I met you? Was I did uh, the Rob Bryden show. Was that what it was called? Yes, yes, yes. Well, it seemed, it seemed the right choice. Um, yes. Yes. Of course, I didn't. I'd forgotten that, Josh. To be honest with you, because no, that, that was that was just a normal. That, that was one was, of my first ever yeah. things I did on TV. We'd always have a new comedian on there. So with that one, I did that. That was one of my first TV appearances. That was an amazing, like, first TV appearance because you had to come on through a door. Yeah, like, like a, was, a a sliding bookcase door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah, I was yeah. on with Mick Hucknell. Oh, and Chris O'Dowd. Mick Hucknall, Chris O'Dowd and Ronnie Wood because Mick yes. was on because he was doing the faces stuff with Ronnie yeah. Wood. That was great fun. That was that yeah. was wonderful. Tell me about supporting Steve because Steve's one of my chums. It was amazing supporting him on tour. It was, he's such a nice bloke, obviously. He, he is, and he obviously, is. He's um, a thoroughly good guy and he's a witty guy. Of course he's witty, oh, he's, but he's witty in his private life because not everybody is. Some people don't make no. the effort. But Stephen is great to be around. He's great company. He's a real laugh. He's really generous. He'd do a lovely off-stage announcement that makes your job ten times easier. Yeah, yeah. Would you watch his show every night? Definitely. I think you learn... I think what from Stephen in particular, you learn that... Um, well, this goes back to that weird kind of... The, to the Muppet thing, in that it's, it's fun to lean into your... Uh, physical weirdness do you know what I mean I, is that the wrong word I hope he doesn't take that in the wrong way but like it's fun to le lean into your peculiarity yeah. or your otherness I suppose which have is you a really heard good that uh, that expression flaunt the imperfection no I haven't but that's a really that's a much crisper way of saying uh, lean into your peculiarity yeah so the thing is now your, your, your book tell us do you have the book you can hold it up if you want I don't have the book yet. oh what no, what kind of what kind of marketeers nightmare are you but but, <laughs> but what but what's the book called Josh it's called watching neighbors twice a day and it's about growing up in the middle of nowhere in the 90s and being obsessed with television okay and each chapter is about a different TV show as the jumping off point 
So people right now could either go to a, an independent bookstore or, 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 or one of the you know online things yeah. and they could buy this book for themselves. They could. I, I don't know if there's any signed copies left on Waterstones. We had to, I signed a lot of copies and then I went on the Waterstones website and the signed copy was two pounds cheaper than the normal copy. Yeah, because so well, you've, you've defaced it essentially. Yes, you? I've been devaluing my own. Book. It, it so, can um, be it can be harder to find an unsigned copy. I, it, it's often the case. <laughs> I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, it's been nice. Lovely, this Josh. is the longest time we've ever spent together. It is, and it's it's been lovely, Josh. Thank you so much. Cheers, Rob. Thanks, mate. Absolute pleasure. pleasure.